Creating an IoT application very often means uh, connecting existing infrastructure and devices to the cloud, to modern applications. Chris just joins me on the IoT show today to talk about these kind of scenarios and what Azure IoT brings to the table for customers to do that. Hey guys, this is the IoT Show. I'm Olivier, your host. Uh, we have Chris Segura with us today, and we'll talk about brownfield scenarios for IoT. And so Chris will tell us what that means, and what is it that you need to pay attention when you connect an existing legacy system yep. to the modern cloud for IoT solutions, right? Yep, definitely. First, Chris, yes. who are you? Uh, who am I? Because I know, I know you, but... We've known each other for a while now. Yes. Um, so I'm a program manager in the same organization that uh, Olivier works for. Uh, my focus, though, is helping partners, uh, especially device partners um, and cloud partners that have to deal with devices, connect the two together. So help them sort of understand what technologies we have on both sides, mm -hmm. how they work together, and how they can build that into sort of an end-to-end -end solution. Okay. So what is it that actually you're focusing on? We're talking about uh, creating new apps with mm -hmm. IoT. IoT is a new thing. There's yep. a digital transformation thing happening. Uh, but in reality, lots of our customers are actually trying to make their existing infrastructure yep. and set of devices mm -hmm. more connected yep. and, and extract data from these devices, insights, take action, and so forth, right? Absolutely. So what is it that they're getting stuck on? Getting stuck on? Um, it depends on who you're talking to. Like, so for example, if you talk to a device developer, uh, they know some of these legacy protocols, legacy scenarios really, really well, but they don't know the cloud nearly as well. So there's a disconnect from them. Of, oh, great, I understand this device. Yeah, yeah. What's this magic cloud? Mm -hmm. If you go to the other side, it's complete opposite, right? You get a cloud developer that knows everything in the cloud really well, yeah. but they don't know devices really well. So mm -hmm. I wind up having very similar discussions quite often uh, when you start talking to people about all these brownfield scenarios of how do you take these legacy devices that have a bunch of rich data and bring them to the cloud. What does it may, mean to do protocol translation? What's the important part of the information you're sending? How do you yeah. do it? Um, so I run through a number of discussions. Again, it just depends on how technical it gets on which side. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we spend more time on the cloud. Sometimes we spend more time on the devices. Um, but for the most part, I wind up talking to people about what a connected device really is and explaining to them that connected devices aren't really new. Connected devices are actually um, quite old, right, in We've general. We've been doing that for Absolutely. a long for, time, right? For a very long time now, right? Um, in many cases, uh, in our buildings are a great example of them. Mm -hmm. We've had connected devices in our buildings for decades, right? Mm -hmm. So I wind up uh, usually starting off. And I'll, but, I'll, but hold on, when we say connected, it's not especially that we're like connected to the cloud or to the internet, correct. right? Correct, they're connected to each other, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, where I usually wind up talking to people, because most people understand this, um, I talk to them about control systems, because control systems have been around for literally decades, yes, right? Yes. So um, I start there, and then I sort of help them understand, well, what does it mean to look at a control system? How does that get connected to the cloud? What does all this magic in the middle actually do? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so like I give a couple of examples and I'll walk you through a bunch of them here. Um, if you look at some of the older um, control system protocols like Modbus for example, mm -hmm. I don't know how many um, of, of your audience is familiar with Modbus, um, but it's a technology that's still quite popular today. Uh, you see it in uh, building power meters, you see it in mm -hmm. control systems for manufacturing. Um, that protocol was first introduced in 1979, so coming up on 40 years now. I was born. Yeah, <laughs> we were both little but at that still. point, but still. <laughs> yep. Not very old. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, and that's just one example, right? So you have you have Modbus, which is quite old. Um, you have CAN bus, which yeah. some people may or may not be familiar with. Um, your entire car is a control system, right? Yeah. There's yeah. a whole lot of subsystems. Your braking subsystem, uh, your steering subsystem, your safety. It's all basically interconnected through CAN bus. And yep, again, yep. that's mid 80s um, manufacturing. Yet again, there's mm. Profi bus, late 80s. Um, even your buildings, like I mentioned, I think a little while ago, yep. our buildings have been connected together for a very long time. Um, there is an industry standard called BACnet, mm -hmm. which helps your HVAC units talk to your power meters, talk to your chillers. Lots of interesting data in your building, in your car, yep, yep. in your manufacturing, but it's kind of stranded there. Yeah, right. But but as we're saying, actually, all these equipments are old, but yep. still functional. Old and still right? functional. Yep. And they are not to be changed immediately. I mean, these protocols that are actually allowing these devices to communicate are here to stay. That's exactly it. In fact, um, 
There's a couple of like good examples where we have, there's a white paper we have online, 88 acres. We talk about using our existing building systems mm -hmm. on BACnet to connect them to the cloud and do energy optimization. Um, we didn't want to change any of the building components because that's expensive. Yep. They're already there doing an important job. You don't want to disrupt the job. Again, it's a control system. I need yep. air flowing in my building. Yep. I need the air and conditioning to work. people working in these buildings. Yes, we yeah, do. Yeah. Yep. So we don't want to change that, right? We just want to connect them to the cloud and get everything, mm -hmm. get all the in interesting data from one building, combine it with every other building we have, and do interesting scenarios like energy management or safety or even space optimization. Okay. Right. Um, the challenge you have, though, is most of these protocols, again, Modbus is a great example. 40 years ago, nobody had a, really the concept of the internet. Nobody considered connecting uh, my robotic arm to the internet. So these protocols, they're not internet routable. Um, they oftentimes don't have any concept of connection management, set yeah, up, tear yeah. down. Um, and quite often, they're not secure, right? They weren't, they're designed to connect one machine to another, yeah. never the world to my well, they, machine. They were secure for that scenario. Correct, yes, yes, right? yep, yeah, exactly. Security by access, basically. Yeah. You had to be in the building, you had to be right in front of it to do anything, so um, at that point, fairly good security, connected yep. to the yep. internet now and things kind of fall apart, right? Um, so we do spend a lot of time talking to people about how you take these two, put them together, uh, and what I wanted to run you through today was just a couple of examples, um, patterns really, not necessarily yeah. any in-depth um, discussion, but patterns of how we try to bridge that gap of what are you trying to do, what's the relevant information, and how does it get to the cloud. Um, for the most part, it's actually quite simple. So uh, mm -hmm. if you have time, I'll walk you through it. I do have time. <laughs> <laughs> and people are stuck with us. Anyways, yeah, this right? is true, <laughs> absolutely. Um, all right, so let, let's just jump into that for a little bit. As I was mentioning before, it's a pretty typical pattern, and it doesn't really matter what type of data you're sending. The yeah, pattern yeah. is the same. It doesn't matter what your interface is, whether it's a serial RS-232, uh, TCP IP. It doesn't really yeah, matter. Yeah. It's really basically the same over mm -hmm. and over. Uh, I'll walk through a JSON example today, uh, largely because I think, uh, one, the cloud understands JSON quite well. Yeah. Uh, a lot of modern devices also understand JSON quite well, but it's also super illustrative of what we're doing because you can read it, right? Yeah. But you don't have to use JSON. Um, this is just an example. So maybe the most obvious place to start is you do need a way to talk to these devices natively. You're mm -hmm. not going to go replace a BACnet device with yeah. an IP-capable device. It's, it's in our roof, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to go do that. Um, the good news is, though, is most of these protocols, because they've been around for so long, have a pretty rich ecosystem of open source solutions, uh, for example, BACnet has an open source stack available, a pretty mm -hmm. rich open source stack. Okay. Uh, Microsoft, we ourselves maintain a Modbus stack for okay. some of our uh, distributions, our SDK for Edge, et cetera. Um, there's plenty of sort of uh, information out there, technology available for you to talk natively. And when there isn't, this is where our team gets involved, frankly, is to yeah. build that ecosystem of partners that'll help deliver these solutions, the domain knowledge of how you talk to these yep, machines. Yep. Once you have that, though, the process is really relatively straightforward uh, with a little bit of, of nuance and detail in there. Um, you really want to focus on what is the cloud data of interest. Um, let me walk you through that just a little bit. Regardless of the protocol, every frame looks something like this. There's point-to-point mm -hmm. -point messaging information. Yep, yep. How do I get my message from A to B? How do I do a little bit of error checking, make sure I didn't mess it up from A to B? Mm -hmm. In general, from the cloud perspective, that's not super interesting data mm -hmm. because the address information is really only relevant locally, right? Like a 10.x right. IP address only yeah. exists in our four walls. It has no internet meaning to it. Got it. Right? Yeah. So for the most part, uh, we tell people you can ignore that. Um, there are times when you may need to recreate this data if you're doing command and control from the cloud. Um, but for the most part, this can all stay local. Yep. It doesn't yep. need to go to the cloud. Uh, the interesting piece sits sort of in the middle here. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about protocols and data, again, there's this end-to-end -end routing piece. The protocol that sits in the middle, or if you're familiar with the OSI stack, sort of one layer above mm -hmm. all of this on the OSI stack, um, generally there, there's also two layers. There's the management of the protocol. Mm -hmm. Again, not super interesting usually from a cloud perspective, because yeah. at the cloud, what you want is the data that you're creating, the data that you're generating. So we really tell people to focus just simply on what you want to look at in the cloud. What do you want to do machine learning on? What do you do mm -hmm. want to do command and control against? Yeah. 
Um, what do you want to do dashboards on, right? Once you've sort of thought through this, and again, it's not a technical issue. It's more of a thought experiment of what- Or a scenario issue. Or a scenario thought. issue, absolutely. Mm -hmm. What do I want to do in the cloud, right? Once you've gotten down to that point, then it becomes pretty trivial. Um, our example here is take the protocol data that you need. Mm -hmm. This might be machine speed, it might be yep. temperature, mm -hmm. um, and turn it into effectively key value pairs. Again, I'm giving an example yep. of JSON here. You could actually do this in binary as well, just with yep. binary data. But in our example, we'll use JSON. Um, one place I do spend a little bit of time talking to people is what does that JSON payload look like, right? So uh, an example you see on the screen here is I've inserted a date time stamp. Mm -hmm largely because when bandwidth isn't an issue, and in many cases it's not, mm -hmm. it's easier to put a date time stamp in my JSON payload than try to extract it from other places. From a coding perspective, from a yeah. developer's perspective, it's just, it's intuitive to get it in this blob yes. yep. rather than pull and it out. Interestingly, you also get a stamp that the moment has been created or generated as close as possible yep. to the device. Exactly, right? absolutely. So, yeah. so you do get a really good correlation there, whereas yeah. if you wait till the cloud, you kind of get the timestamp of when it arrived there. Yes. And there's a lot in between here and there, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other piece that we talk about too, though, is you oftentimes, not the point-to-point -point address, but you need the device name that's sending the information. So for example, mm -hmm. uh, I have a 10.x address in this machine, but it also has a name to it. Uh -huh. I might need that name in the cloud just so I know where the information came from. So we do sort of talk to partners and say, okay, timestamps are great. Device names are usually super important. Um, the actual data you're generating or getting, mm -hmm. like rotation mm -hmm. speed, all of these, pretty self-explanatory. You want them in the cloud. Oftentimes, what's missing, though, um, even at the protocol layer, is units, units of measure. Because again, for these old protocols, people just assumed you knew what you were connecting. right? Yes. I knew what this machine was. I knew what that machine was. I knew what they're doing. Yeah, and sometimes you, you pick the data directly from the register, yeah, if exactly. you can, like coding stuff, and you just... And it's a yeah. number, right? Yeah. For you, send 30 to the cloud, and the cloud goes, fantastic. 30... <laughs> 30 what? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so we do talk to people a lot about making sure, sometimes the protocol gives you, sometimes you have to insert it yourself, right? What are the units of measure? Again, making it easy for the cloud developer to understand what is the context of the information mm -hmm. you're sending mm -hmm. to them. Um, from that part, everything is kind of magic and kind of done for you. Like for example, um, my next bullet will say, okay, let's wrap that telemetry in a cloud-ready packet, yeah, yeah. AMQP. It sounds complicated and the underlying stacks are complicated. Mm -hmm. From a developer standpoint, especially if they're using our SDKs, it's one line of code. Create this the string, message, yeah. create this message. Yeah, and then send. And then send it, right? And so I have a little yeah. simple code snippet there, but it's literally from one of our samples online. It's create yeah. the message and send it. Our underlying stacks take care of all of that. Um, so that's largely it, right? Cool. It's just a good discussion. I did yeah. want to show you kind of a edge example that I think most people will understand, but yeah. it highlights where all this sits into a network, into a stack, into a solution. Mm -hmm. You have these devices generating all this great data. Grab a module from our marketplace eventually, create mm -hmm. your own module, whatever you want to do. This is the piece that speaks natively to the other to the machine. Yep. The other side of that, um, in this diagram it speaks JSON. That's a little simplified because JSON isn't a message format. Mm -hmm. JSON mm -hmm. is a string. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we, it's good to show it this way because people understand they're just sharing JSON messages from module to module. Realize underneath the hood there, there's a little bit more going on, but this is a simplified view. Makes sense. Uh, and then Edge takes care of everything else for you. Okay. Right? So super simple, super straightforward. No reason why not to do it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yep. Cool. Yeah, so basically, um, you know, translation of protocols, but also bringing intelligence at the cloud, right? Some processing e as well. Exactly, and that's, that's the yeah. benefit of having sort of a unified egress and ingress using JSON, right? I understand what you're sending me. Yeah. You don't have to worry what the next box, black box down um, mm -hmm. down your path is doing. It'll figure out what to do with that JSON yeah. data. And, and basically right. you end up retrofitting existing working equipment into a broader application where you can exactly. get more and you can start optimizing on your processes as well, yep. doing predictive maintenance and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Awesome, Chris, that was very insightful. Cool. I hope to have you soon on the show again, right? Yep, absolutely. Okay, cool. Thank you. Great, thanks.